I said in the knee osteology lecture that the knee is unstable in terms of um, bony structure. So it needs a lot of soft tissue structure in order to support it. And so we're going to talk about the um, really the movements of the knee and this what provides its stability. So I want you to be able to identify the joint types and motions available at each joint in the knee. So um, as we said before, the um, tibial femoral joint is a condylar joint. Um, you can there's flexion extension and internal and external rotation. So there are two um, degrees of freedom. At the patellar joint, the patellofemoral joint is a planar joint. And um, so there is basically two degrees of freedom, but kind of one plus. You can think of it that way. And so its main function is for increasing torque and doesn't really increase mobility as much as the other joint in the knee. Um, I want you to be able to describe the function of the mechanism of injury for the um, cruciate ligaments, the menisci, and the collateral ligaments of the knee joint. So we'll um, look at some diagrams and um, talk about potential problems that can happen there. I want you to be able to explain the screw home mechanism of the knee and what osteological feature of the knee causes the screw home mechanism. And um, I want you to be able to describe the significance of the patella and how it affects the um, torque of the quadriceps. And it does it by increasing the moment arm. And define Q angle and what is it? So the anterior and posterior cruciate ligament, cruciate means cross. Um, they are, they're an X in the middle of the knee, basically, if you want to think of it that way. Um, the cruciate ligaments interconnect the tibia with the femur. Um, the predominant, um, they are the predominant stability of the knee in the anterior posterior direction. So, um, they protect the knee against anterior posterior shear forces. So if you think of the tibia as being one of the tests that they do to test the integrity of your um, cruciate ligaments is called the anterior drawer test. And basically the tibia is the drawer. So when the tibia moves forward, you're um, putting the anterior cruciate ligament on slack. So you're pulling out the drawer. When you're pushing the tibia back, you're putting you're pushing in the drawer and you're putting the um, anterior cruciate ligament on slack. So the um, ACL stretches when you pull the drawer out and it goes on slack when you push the drawer in. Okay, so the drawer test is a good way to remember it. The anterior cruciate ligament resists anterior translation of the tibia relative to a fixed femur. So that's open chain. So in open chain, if the tibia is moving, it resists the anterior translation of the femur, of the tibia on the femur. In closed chain, it resists posterior translation of the femur on the tibia. So it's the same motion, just which side's moving. Okay, so the, the drawer is still going out. Um, the posterior cruciate ligament does just the opposite. So the posterior cruciate ligament resists posterior translation of the tibia relative to a fixed femur. So it resists the drawer going in. Um, in. In closed chain, it resists anterior translation of the femur on a relatively fixed tibia. So um, look at the pictures in the book play with bony models, whatever you need to do. There's a nice little um, box on page 283 that describes the open chain and closed chain motions um, and what motions are resisted by the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. So <clears throat> the anterior cruciate is frequently injured during sporting events that generate a combination of rotational valgus and hyperextension producing forces through the knee. So anything where you plant your foot and somebody hits you from the side, that is gonna produce um, 
rotational valgus and hyperextension producing forces. So a valgus force is one that comes in from the side of the knee. Um, it's much more common to have valgus forces than varus forces, because in order to have a varus force, it would have to hit the inside of your knee, and the other leg sort of protects you from that. So um, you are much more commonly going to get valgus forces in um, sporting events, anything where your foot is planted and you get hit from the side in contact sports. In um, sports like skiing, um, you are weighting the inner edge of the ski in order to turn and that produces valgus stress at the knee. So um, valgus stresses are much more common, valgus and rotational stretches are much more common in um, functional activities than varus forces. So I'm gonna enlarge this a little bit. So this is our um, function of, from the lateral view of the ACL and the PCL. So saying whether something is anterior or posterior, it's talking about where it attaches relative, relatively on the tibia. So the anterior cruciate ligament attaches posteriorly on the femur and goes to anteriorly on the tibia. Um, this is the ACL that we're looking at here. So in open chain, um, the ACL resists anterior translation of the tibia. That's the drawer getting pulled out. Um, in closed chain, it resists, and it resists posterior translation of the femur. It's still the drawer getting pulled out, the tibia being the drawer, but the top, the uh, femur is moving posteriorly. So hopefully that makes sense. And now the PCL, it attaches anteriorly on the femur and posteriorly on the tibia. So it's named by where it attaches relatively on the tibia. So the PCL resists posterior translation of the tibia in open chain, and the, um, it resists anterior translation of the femur in closed chain, okay? So it helps to say what's translating on what. So the tibia translating on the femur or the femur translating on the tibia. So in open chain, it's going to be the tibia is moving because the proximal segment is relatively fixed. In closed chain, it's going to be the femur moving because the distal segment is relatively fixed. So hopefully that makes sense. So in terms of injuries, the PCL is injured far less often than the ACL, but it may be ruptured along with the ACL and sometimes the um, meniscus and sometimes the medial collateral ligament. And it's often, um, surgery is often required to repair um, those ligaments. Before they had good surgeries for repairing the ligaments, they were often just removed. So the, um, the damaged ligaments were removed and the person is walking around without an ACL and a PCL. Can you do that? Absolutely. But you have to keep the muscle strong in order to maintain stability in your knee. So there is a table in the book that summarizes uh, mechanisms of injury of the um, supporting structures of the knee. It's on um, page 285. That's a really good one to look at. And it talks about um, the different ligaments and the most common mechanisms of injury. So um, really that's a lovely table. So besides the ACL, we have the medial and lateral collateral ligaments. Um, some of our other joints have medial and lateral collateral ligaments. So whenever you're talking about a structure that has another structure in the body that has that same name like epicondyles and lateral and medial collateral ligaments and things like that, you wanna specify of the knee or of the femur or of the tibia. <laughs> so um, we know that there are medial and collateral um, ligaments, but the ones of the knee are the ones that we're talking about. So the medial and collateral ligaments of the knee strengthen the medial and lateral sides of the knee and they protect against excessive genu varus or genu valgus. So the medial collateral ligament protects against excessive genu valgus. 
um, the lateral collateral ligament protects against excessive genu varus. So um, in this picture, the, um, you can see a lot of the connective tissue. The ligaments are sort of the, um, this is the medial collateral ligament. The meniscus is um, between the um, femur and the tibia. You can see that really well. Um, so the medial collateral ligament spans the medial side of the knee. It resists those valgus producing forces. Um, the medial collateral ligament becomes taut at full extension. So it's useful for locking an extended knee while standing. So anytime when the um, ligaments are taut, it's supporting stability in that structure. So um, this compares valgus and varus forces um, on the knee and it's an anterior view with the patella removed. So you can see what's happening with the ACL and the PCL and the lateral and medial collateral ligaments. So when you have a valgus producing force, which is force coming in from the lateral side of the knee medially, this is the more common one, you can, um, you can damage the anterior cruciate ligament, you can damage the medial collateral ligament, you could also um, damage the medial meniscus. Um, if you have a varus producing force, you're gonna be putting stress on the PCL and the lateral collateral ligament. So of course, the valgus producing force is way more common than um, the varus producing force. So the medial collateral ligament is naturally a little beefier because it resists those valgus producing forces. Um, both ligaments are taut when the knee is in full extension, and that helps with locking the knee. So the medial and lateral meniscus are connective tissue. They're fibrocartilaginous discs that are um, seated on top of the tibial plateau, the tibial, medial, and lateral condyles. They absorb compressive forces across the knee caused by muscular contraction and body weight. You know, they absorb some of that, uh, the forces, the compressive forces at the knee. Um, they reduce pressure across the knee and they deepen the socket of the knee to stabilize the joint a little bit more. So um, really when are walking, when we're walking, our compressive forces at the knee can be two or three times your body weight. So we need something strong in there um, to reduce the pressure across the knee. And then just because they're a little bit cup shaped, they, um, they deepen the socket a little bit and help, the, help with joint congruency. So really the menisci, they act as shock absorbers, they reduce friction and they dissipate those compressive forces. Um, they also increase the surface area of joint contact and they reduce joint pressure by doing that. Um, and they improve joint congruency. And they are part of the, of the roll and slide. And so they're helping with normal joint arthrokinematics. Meniscus does not have very good, and a lot of cartilage does not have a very good blood supply. So if you injure your meniscus, if you tear your meniscus, um, how it heals is going to depend on what part of it is torn. So the outer part has a better supply than the inner part. So if you tear the inside of your meniscus, it is probably not going to heal very well because it has little to no blood supply. And you will likely need surgery to remove that torn part if it is blocking the function of your knee. Um, if you have a small tear in the outer ring of the meniscus, it might heal by itself. So um, that is something for um, you and your uh, orthopedic surgeon to decide. So about um, 30 years ago, I had a lovely meniscus tear um, due to some valgus stress uh, during skiing. And um, I did have a partial meniscectomy in my right knee, um, had part of the meniscus removed. And um, actually I don't really have any problems with it. So it's important to keep the knee strong after that. And that's something that we work on with physical therapy. A lot of the tests that they will um, do to test the integrity of the meniscus involve pressure 
and um, seeing how the knee is moving a little bit of rotational pressure. And um, so the uh, meniscus is absorbing those compressive forces. And so that's how they test it. The posterior capsule is a big beefy um, collection of connective tissues on the posterior side of the knee that prevent knee hyperextension. So it includes um, some the um, bigger ligaments on the posterior side of the knee. Um, if your knees have marked hyperextension, it's known as genu recurvatum. Um, that puts a lot of, with a lot of hyperextension, it puts a lot of strain on those posterior capsule structures. And you can actually um, contribute to instability in the knee. So take a look at people's knees the next time you're out and about. It's a little harder in the wintertime when people are wearing long pants. In the summer when they're wearing shorts, you can really look at their knees and see who has hyperextended knees, who has um, slightly bent knees. Um, it's interesting to look at people's different knees. So that having been said, if somebody's out of the, um, the normal alignment, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong. Um, it just means that they're out of the normal alignment. It might cause problems later on, but it doesn't necessarily cause problems just because it's um, a different alignment. So the tibiofemoral joint allows two degrees of freedom flexion, extension, and internal and external rotation. Flexion and extension occur in the sagittal plane about a medial lateral axis of rotation. Internal and external rotation occurs in the horizontal plane about a vertical or longitudinal axis of rotation. Flexion and extension of the knee are voluntary movements, right? We decide we're gonna bend or straighten our knee. Um, internal and external rotation of the knee are not really voluntary movements the way internal and external rotation of the shoulder are. They actually happen more as a consequence of the osteo, of the arthrokinematics um, at the end range of extension. So in about the last 20 degrees of extension, we get some built-in um, internal and external rotation in order to stabilize the knee joint. So flexion and extension um, are accompanied by those slight rotational movements. So as the knee nears full extension, the knee rotates um, externally about 10 to 15 degrees. And um, the automatic rotation assists in locking the knee and it's called the screw home mechanism. So I have a little um, video that we're gonna look at that's an animation of the screw home mechanism to see if we can see that. So the reason the screw home mechanism happens is because the medial um, femoral condyle is a little bit longer by about half an inch than the um, lateral femoral condyle. So as you go into extension, the lateral femoral condyle is um, fully articulated, but the medial femoral condyle has to glide posteriorly to use its entire articular surface. So in knee, uh, with knee extension in non-weight bearing, the tibia rotates externally. With full extension in weight bearing, the femur rotates internally on the tibia, okay? So we're gonna look at an animation to show this. Okay, so this video shows an animation of the rotation of the knee from some different aspects. So first of all, it's just um, gonna show some landmarks just so we can get oriented. So our patellar ligament, our medial collateral ligament. You can see the ACL and the PCL and the uh, medial meniscus. Okay, so the knee becomes locked during extension and it's unlocked during flexion. Um, the locking and unlocking are in that last 
15 to 20 degrees. So this is the anterior, this is the um, medial view and see how the tibia rotates laterally on the femur. Okay, so let's, let's look at that one more time. Okay, medial view, that's the anterior view. Medial view, I think, is the easiest to see the tibia rotating laterally. Okay, so let's look at that again. So flexion. Good. So hopefully watching that animation was helpful. You can see how at full extension, the tibia rotates laterally on the femur in open chain to use up that extra half inch of articular surface on the medial femoral condyle. Um, if you're in closed chain, the femur is gonna rotate internally or medially on the tibia. Okay, so um, hopefully that makes sense and we'll keep talking about it if it doesn't. So the articulation between the posterior surface of the patella and the intercondylar groove of the femur is the patellofemoral joint. So the patella's job is to increase torque producing capability of the quadriceps by increasing the length of the moment arm. So longer moment arm, more torque, right? So the patella increases the torque producing capability of the quadriceps by about 25%. So if you have your patella removed, you have a patellectomy, the quadriceps has to produce 25% more force. And the increased need for muscle force might cause fatigue or damage to the joints. So um, I have worked with people who had patellectomies um, I worked with one lady after she had her total knee replacement, and she had had a patellectomy many years before because of an accident, an injury. And so she, her quadriceps were very weak. She did not have full extension of her knee before her total knee replacement, and therefore did not have it afterwards. And we had to work quite a bit more on um, quadriceps strengthening and knee extension than we normally do with people with total knee replacements. So seeing the aftermath like that of a patellectomy really um, focuses in on the importance of the patella in um, knee function. So the Q angle, also known as the patellofemoral angle, is the angle between the quadriceps muscle, and mostly we're using the rectus femoris as a midline of the quadriceps muscle, and the patellar tendon. Um, so you'll see different normals listed in different books. In our textbook, it says 13 to 15 degrees. Some texts say 10 to 15 degrees. Let's just say it's around 15 degrees and maybe a little bit less. Um, Q angle tends to be slightly larger in females. Um, that doesn't mean that because you're female, you're going to have a larger Q angle. It just means that on average, females have a larger Q angle. So um, the consequences of a larger Q angle is that um, you have more laterally directed forces in the patella and it can cause problems with patellar tracking. So um, the quadriceps angle has to do with that um, shape of the femur that is directing the knee, um, the distal femur towards the knee and um, so if you have more of an angle, you're going to have a, a larger Q angle. If you have less of an angle, you're going to have a smaller Q angle. And so it's going to affect, potentially affect the tracking of your patella.